Acts chapter 2 this morning. I can't help but smile as I give that reference because I'm very excited about the passage before us. And as we turn there, I, I want to invite you to pray with me something that I pray weekly as I prepare to preach. The very first thing that I do is to look at Psalm 19. You don't have to turn there because of the promises that Psalm 19 gives about God's Word. And so I'd like to invite you to pray with me that these promises would be revealed this morning as we read Acts chapter 2. Let's pray over Psalm 19 together. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Lord, we're about to open your word. Would you revive our souls? Revive my soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Lord, we are simple in ourselves. We are prone to foolish thinking, worldly thoughts. Would you give us your wisdom? The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Lord God, would you give joy to the weary this morning? Rejoice us in the good news of your word. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Yes, Lord, would you bring light, spiritual insight to our eyes. Help us to see what we cannot see on our own. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Lord, cause your word to create an enduring fear of you, an enduring awe and reverence for you. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Lord God, we believe what we're about to read is true and righteous without any error or falsehood. We trust in it. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Lord Jesus, would you reveal that value of your word this morning? Lord, it is more valuable than much fine gold. Better for us to open your word than to find buried treasure. Better for us to open your word than to find an overwhelming bank account. Better for us to open your word than to have a feast of the greatest food earth could provide. Better, Lord, to open your word. So speak to us through your word, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's begin reading Acts chapter 2, the first 13 verses of this second chapter. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together. And they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said they are filled with new wine. 
members of this church at any length of time know that one of my favorite series of books is the Chronicles of Narnia. I'm obviously not alone in that, but given the number of times I illustrate from those books, um, people that haven't read them know the stories in this church. Uh, but one of the uh, favorite scenes in those books, for many that have read them, is the scene when three children are sitting with two talking beavers, and they're being introduced to the land of Narnia, and in this meeting, they're introduced to the central figure of that land and of all the stories, the Christ figure representationally of the stories, Aslan the lion. And when they are introduced, the beavers say with a kind of quivering anticipation, they say Aslan is on the move, perhaps already landed. And they go on to describe the children's response to this name and this news. And they say, at the name of Aslan, each one of the children felt something jump in its inside. They felt something jump in its inside. At the news, Aslan is on the move perhaps already landed. Acts chapter 2 is about someone on the move. The first chapter of Acts prepared us theologically for this truth. Jesus announces that this will take place. The symbolic 12 number of apostles representing a newly constituted Israel is fulfilled when Matthias is chosen. And then they wait a couple of days. Apparently they're on Pentecost, the feast of the Jews. And there, about 50 days after Jesus rose, there they are and something happens. And God is on the move. This is one of those moments in the Bible that is era creating. It creates a, an, an era, an epoch, if I could call it that, a, a time period is marked here. We can imagine nations that would, would point to a moment in time. We think of Lexington and Concord and the shot heard round the world. At that moment, something happened, something began, and other moments in history are like that. Well, this moment is the moment that started the modern era from God's perspective. This is the moment from God's perspective that the final era of human history began. The era that will conclude when Jesus returns and restores the new heavens and the new earth and his people go to be with him. This moment, God is on the move. And he's on the move in a particular way. God's spirit comes upon God's people in such a way that they will transform the world with the gospel. And that's the summary point, I think, of this passage. It's what we're supposed to get out of it. God's spirit in God's people will transform the world with the gospel. God is on the move. I've said before, and let me say it again. Though the church is present and even uh, prioritized in the book of Acts, the leading figure, the central character of the book of Acts is not the people of God. It's God himself. It's not the church of God, though they are the instrument, the means, but God himself is the one who is advancing his gospel. It's very clear because the coming of the Spirit is the sequel of the ascension of Jesus Christ. And so theologically, it's very important what happens. Jesus is crucified for sinners. He rises from the dead. He ascends to heaven at the right hand of God. And then the Spirit of God is poured out on the people. And then God begins to move. The Spirit of God in the people of God will transform the world with the gospel. That's the, the summary of this passage and it's what initiates this era of a gospel advancing around the world. He is on the move, Acts chapter 2 says, in a profound way. And the way he begins to move is indicative. It speaks of the character of this era for God's people. It's how we're supposed to think about this era. All right, three points to understand this initial story. The divine arrival, divine arrival, supernatural results, 
and revealing response. Divine arrival, supernatural results, and revealing response. Let's look at divine arrival in the first few verses. It says they're all together at Pentecost. As I said, Pentecost was a, a feast that followed Passover of the covenant of God with his people, and they're all together in one place. I think we're supposed to take that as the 120 that are there, the gathering of those who have followed Jesus and believed in Jesus after his resurrection. And then it says, Suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind that filled the house and then divided tongues of fire rest on each one of them. Now, it's important that we understand this wind and fire imagery would be symbolic of God's presence coming among his people. So if you know your Old Testament, you know that to be the case, that, that wind and fire and this kind of whirlwind and the appearance of fire was, was a way that God would show himself to be among his people. We, we know from the scriptures that God is spirit. He, he's not like us. That's why the incarnation is so amazing that Jesus took on human flesh. But God is spirit. And so this wind and fire would represent in a way that their, their minds could understand God is among you. The commentator Daryl Bach says this, The new era has begun with the promised spirit's arrival. The national list of Jews is a hint of where the story is going out into the entire world. Associations with wind and fire point to a theophany. That's a, a God revealing himself. A theophany. God is powerfully present directing his mission. We look back at the history of God's people, you can see why they would see fire as a representation of God. When, when Moses encountered God in the wilderness, the great deliverer of Israel, he encountered the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He saw him as a bush that was burning but was not consumed. So God represents himself in that way. And then the people of Israel were, were led through the wilderness by a pillar of fire by night. So that pillar of fire that they're following is supposed to tell them, God is among you. God is with you. And then when the tabernacle was completed and they put together this tent where God was going to live with them, among them, it says a cloud, the cloud of God's glory came down on the tabernacle. So this idea of smoke and fire and the presence of God, it's, it would have been a, a, a deeply uh, a valued historical heritage for God's people. And so they, they would have a clear sense God, the, the, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, the God of the wilderness, he's here in this very house. It's somewhat surprising because you would think if God would show up anywhere in Jerusalem, it would be in the temple. And yet God's revealing something miraculous here. That his presence is no longer a part of a physical structure as a temple, but he's within those who have claimed Jesus as the Messiah. Remarkable, because it would seem like if you're a Jew and you've been tracking along covenantal history, maybe he'd be come back to Mount Sinai again. But there's something theological going on here, because the people who encounter the presence of God are those who have laid claim to Jesus' promise as the Messiah and his resurrection. So that this is the new location of God's presence. Those who believe in Jesus are those who encounter the presence of God. And yet the good news doesn't stop there. Because it doesn't describe, it actually takes great pains to not describe a central pillar of fire which any God-fearing Jew would have come to expect and would still be surprised by that it's here in this house. Instead, it takes pains to emphasize that divided tongues of fire rested on each one of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So here's the, the shocker for these Jewish men and women sitting here. Here's the shocker. Not only has the God of Moses come to our gathering and is among us in power and might, revealing himself as he revealed himself to the Israelites in the wilderness and Moses in the bush. Not only that, but he's not just among us as a people. He's coming upon each one of us. So that there is not just this central pillar where God is among the people. No, he is individually imparting himself into each one of them. This is the shocker news of Acts chapter 2. 
the God of Moses has come to indwell not just his people corporately, but his people individually, and not just the chosen leaders, but everyone. This is going to be explicit when Peter walks out of this meeting and begins to preach and, and references the Old Testament prophecy of Joel, which said that everyone, sons and daughters, men and women, leaders and servants, all will experience the indwelling of God's presence among them. This is nothing less than divine arrival in the community of Christ. Divine arrival in the people of Christ. Divine indwelling of those who have claimed Jesus as the Messiah. The Spirit of God in the people of God, in each person of God, will transform the world with the gospel. The gift of his presence is individualized. Now, the theological meaning of this is that there is a reversal of the exile from God's presence that's been happening ever since Adam and Eve were thrust out of the garden because of sin. There's a reversal of this. Adam and Eve sinned against God, and they were thrust. They were cast away from God's presence. And they were not allowed back in. And God's people were not allowed to approach God. Even on the mountain, they could see him. They could witness him. But he said, don't come too close. You will be consumed. Don't come too close. You will be destroyed. And now that very fire of God's presence is resting on each one of these imperfect but following Jesus disciples so that there is a reversal of the exile. People have been brought back into God's presence because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. God's presence has been distributed to each one of them. The implications are profound. God dwells within each follower of Jesus Christ. God dwells within each follower of Jesus Christ. Christian, let, let, me, let me tell you the most profound thing about you. God dwells within you if you believe in Jesus Christ. God, we are Trinitarian, which means that the Father, Son, and Spirit are fully God. You cannot explain that in human terminology. God, God is, exists in a way that we cannot fully comprehend, but we know it's true. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit of God. There is one God. And so when it says the Spirit of God is upon each of them, it's saying that God dwells within each believer in Jesus Christ. So let's, let's make this very, very personal. Very personal. You are indwelt, if you are a Christian, by the Spirit of God himself. God is with you. God is with you when you wake up in the morning and you're aware of all that you have to do. God is within you. When you're aware of those sin categories that continue to plague you that you've been fighting against for decades, God is with you. And Paul says in Galatians, he is fighting against that sin on your behalf. When you speak to that neighbor and you're fearful like I am of, of what they might think of you, God, the God of heaven and earth, is within you, giving you words to say and empowering your witness for the gospel. When you are afraid that your pattern of difficulty and sin and struggle will keep you someday out of heaven, remember, God is within you to will and to work for his good pleasure, and God gives you the assurance that you're the son or daughter of the Most High God. God is the one who assures you that he has forgiven your sins on account of the name. Christian, God is within you. You are not struggling up towards heaven in your own strength. Heaven has come down to earth and has indwelt the people of God. God is within you. So what are you afraid of right now? What am I afraid of? Perhaps a, a sin category that you've been struggling this with, with this week or, or maybe the, the difficulty of, of uniting with Christians that are different than you. God is within you. And if they're a Christian, God is within them, and there is nothing more unifying than that. It's like an implication of this divine arrival. The Christian religion is not a man-made way of life. It's a divine event. It is not a man-made way of life. It is not a man-made way of life. 
Let me free you from the false guilt that the culture puts on Christians. The culture tells Christians, who are you to say that your way of following God is better than mine? Our answer is, we're nobody except that God has come upon his people, the followers of Jesus Christ. There is a real God, and that real God has come upon a real people, and that real people have an identity. Their identity is that they follow Jesus and they believe in him. If you want to know where God is, he's among those who claim Jesus Christ as the risen Lord and Savior. There is one place on earth where God certainly is, and that is among those who are worshiping and following Jesus Christ. So no, we haven't come up with some religion that we think is, is more clever than the next guy. We're not trying to sell our idea. We're just trying to let the world know what is real, that God really is among his people, vindicating and validating the claims of Jesus to be God's own son, the savior of the world. The Christian religion is not a man-made way of life, but a divine event, the divine arrival. This, this arrival is what's called in theological terms the, the new covenant that is given to God's people because of what Jesus has done. This is a significant difference. There's a discontinuity here between the new uh, people of God, if I can call them that, and the people of God in the old covenant. There is a difference here. Yes, they followed God. Yes, they were converted. Yes, the Spirit of God was among them. But there is an intentional distinction when it's talking about the individualized nature of God's people. We could look at the Old Testament where it says, I will write my law on their hearts. Well, how, how will you do that? Well, I will be within them as their God. This individualized the good news that God's Spirit is within his people. He is within them. They're not just among them. He is changing them from the inside out. Brothers and sisters, we live in the greatest era of biblical history. Do you know that? If you've ever struggled, sometimes my, my children struggle sometimes. They like, well, why, how, how come we don't get to see some of the stuff they got to see? Boy, I, I would have loved to see the parting of the Red Sea. I, I would have just loved to see those, those idols topple over. I, I would love to see God wipe out those armies and some of those, those physical representations of God, what he did back. I would have loved to, to see that. And I said, well, maybe God will do that. But you know something better. God is within you. You've been given spiritual insight to know who Jesus Christ is. divine arrival has taken place. The world can never be the same. Divine arrival. Point number two, supernatural result. Supernatural result. If you notice in verse four that they, being filled with the Holy Spirit, they immediately begin to speak in other tongues, that's just other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So, uh, they just begin to speak in languages they do not know, uh, but they're actually communicating something, and we're made aware of that because apparently they were speaking quite loudly, and maybe they were so excited they went outside and began speaking loudly, and apparently they were so loud that men all around Jerusalem begin to gather together to hear what is going on, and they are bewildered, it says in verse 6. They are bewildered because they're hearing Galileans speak their native language. These are transparently uneducated men. And they begin to speak not just in one language, but notice how many languages are referenced here. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, Cyrene, visitors from Rome, proselytes, Cretans, Arabians... We're hearing them tell, in our own language, the mighty works of God. So what, what is the result of the Holy Spirit coming upon God's people? Well, it's a supernatural result. It's not a natural result. But this is the major thing, one major thing, that's wrong with a kind of self-help Christianity that's so prevalent in Christian bookstores today. Well, just improve yourself. 
have a better life. Or if you hear representations of the gospel at times that say, well, Jesus wants to help you have a better life. Physically, practically. If if you're in debt, he wants to get you out of debt. And and if you have uh, difficult relationships, he wants to bring you peace. And he wants to give you a sort of a better, smoother, uh, more financially productive life. That's what he really wants to do. Well, well, God may want to do that in somebody's life, help them get out of debt. Maybe so. I don't know. But that's not the center, the point of what God is doing. He's not doing something natural. This isn't self-improvement. It's not to improve your natural life. He's doing something supernatural. We're not looking for a better earth, a slightly improved earth. We're looking for heaven that's come to earth. We're not looking for a a, a better way of life. We're looking for a transformed way of life. That's what God says is happening here. That's the point of this initial miracle. What is happening in this house is supernatural. You've come to encounter God, devout Jews from all over the world. You've come to encounter God at the Feast of Pentecost. Guess where God is? In this house with these followers of Jesus. In one sense, God is fulfilling their desire. These people, apparently devout Jewish men primarily, from all around the world, were trying to be faithful to the God of the covenant. They they pilgrimaged all the way across the known world to Jerusalem because they, they want to follow God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who revealed himself in fire on Sinai, the God who said that one day a prophet greater than Moses would come, And they're wanting to follow that God. And so here they come. They come to Jerusalem, but contrary to their expectations, God is no longer found in the old symbols of the temple. He's now found in this multilingual gathering of normal Galileans proclaiming the mighty works of God in every known language. There's a number of things this supernatural result is intended to do. First and foremost... It's intending to communicate the sheer fact that God is outside of our natural limitations. Now, now this is a language event. And certainly elsewhere in the New Testament, one of the things that, that Paul talks about is that there are occasions where God's people can maybe, might be given the ability to speak in another language, declare the praise of God. The gift of tongues is referenced in 1 Corinthians. But, but in this event, I, I don't think the focus is on the language event so much as it is the supernatural nature of the event. The, the, the point is not so much that they could speak a different language. We're not told that they, they had these languages permanently, that, that Peter just abruptly was given the ability to speak Greek or, or to speak uh, Arabian, whatever language they're referring to there, just, just spont- for the rest of his life. He just now has this language ability. The, the point here is a miraculous infusion of ability that can only be attributed to God. That can only be attributed to God. That's the point here. There's so many nations, this can't be a coincidence. That's the point here. There's so many nations, this can't be man-made. This can't be faked. How is it possible that this uneducated gathering of Galileans can speak this many languages? Only one explanation. God is on the move. So it's to reveal the miraculous that the supernatural God is moving. It's also to reveal something of a reversal, a rolling back of what's taken place in history. There's a, there's a sort of first fruits here, a first fruits of a harvest, an indication of something that is about to happen. Commentator David Peterson helps us see this. He says, for one brief moment of time. The divisions in humanity expressed through language difference were overcome. These divisions are presented in Genesis as the judgment of God. That's the Tower of Babel. What happened on the day of Pentecost suggests that God's curse has been removed. God was expressing his ultimate intention to unite people from every tribe and language and people and nation under the rule of his son, providing reconciliation through him and access to the Father by one spirit. 
So what God is doing symbolically here, by, by li- physically, literally, they're gathering, think, think about the, the moment of this, people from all over the known world, it says, they're gathering together and they're hearing God, the God they've come to worship, worshiped in their own language, <laughs> proclaimed this way by people who, following, who follow a crucified Messiah. There's this first fruits at Pentecost. This proclamation is going to reach every nation in this world. It's going to reach every tongue so that representatives from every tongue will not only hear, but they will proclaim the mighty works of God, and in particular, the mightiest work of God, the salvation of Jesus Christ. Certainly the emphasis here on speaking is prioritized, I think, because of the speaking emphasis in the book of Acts. It is not the only thing the Spirit of God does. I don't think we're to read speaking in tongues in Acts chapter 2 as the normative way that every Christian experiences the power of God when it first comes upon them. There was, there was a certain uh, emphasis here because of this miraculous first fruits being revealed that this gospel will go to every nation as they gather together. We don't have any indication in the rest of the New Testament that the only way God's Spirit moves in God's people is to allow them to speak in other languages. So I don't think we're to, to read this as a normative expression or manifestation, but we are to read as normative that God's people experience the supernatural when God's Spirit comes upon them. So how that's going to be expressed might be different from one church to the next, from one Christian to the next. What is normative is that God always acts like God. God always moves like God. God always does what only God can do, because as he said in the Psalms, my glory I will not give to another. And so the people of God are to expect supernatural results when God is on the move. So Redemption Hill Church, what does that mean for us? It means that we believe that God, the God of heaven and earth, is moving within us, and we are to expect and anticipate and desire things that only God can do. So let me invite us to consider, being people of Pentecost means we expect the Spirit of God to do in the people of God what only God can do and to reveal the outworking, the full harvest of this first fruits here, in particular in evangelism. Evangelism is the accented manifestation of the Spirit of God in the book of Acts. Now, there are other manifestations. The Spirit works to assure us of our adoption, of our inheritance. You can read that in Romans chapter 8. He works to fight against our flesh and our sin. You can read that in Galatians 5. He he, he works to give us the, the confidence to proclaim the gospel, and that's the emphasis in the book of Acts. But, but the point is, we are not meant to expect merely man-made results following the God of heaven and earth. We serve the God who can turn Galilean fishermen into language experts in a moment. We serve the God who can time an event such that representatives from every nation are gathered within the hearing of fishermen who can proclaim in their own language the mighty works of God. We serve that God. I've said before, let me just repeat it again. It is no good trying to pick and choose isolated supernatural events in the Bible and conform them to the cynicism of this age. It's no good. It doesn't work. Typical, mostly American Western cynicism about the Bible, it picks a certain supernatural event in the Bible and it attempts to say, well, that could never have happened. So we'll seek to explain that by natural means. But underneath that is this idea and desire that there isn't really a supernatural God. Maybe there's a God out there, but the world ultimately is sovereign. Physical realities are sovereign. Physical rules are sovereign. The Bible says nonsense, and you can't pick and choose. Look, if you want to throw out a certain supernatural event, you might as well throw out the Bible, because the Bible is supernatural, and Christians are meant to be. 
Trust me, if, if, if you're struggling at times with the changing culture that we're living in, and, and maybe there's certain aspects of the Christian faith that you found to be awfully culturally embarrassing these days, tr- trust me, we, we, are, we are far more embarrassing <laughs> than, than, than just one particular category of the Christian life. We're, we're, we're crazier than that. We believe there's a super... We, this actually happened. This, this was a real day. They were gathered in a room. I don't know how big, but somewhere like this, a room like this, and they're gathered, and all of a sudden, regular, ordinary people began speaking in a different language. As if I just began speaking in Chinese right now, and right outside that door, there's somebody that is from China, and all of a sudden they hear, well, what he's saying is that God is great and powerful, and his steadfast love knows no end, and that we can trust him, and the God of Israel has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. I I don't know what they were saying, but something like that. And he comes in and says, how is this possible? How do you know my language? You don't get caught up in the modern... This, this wasn't Google Translate era, okay? This, this wasn't like they, they, they came in and thought, well, man, you, you must have really taken some online courses. No, no. no this, this was impossible, exactly. No person could do this, exactly. They can't fake this, exactly. God and God alone could make this happen, which means that the God who is the only God is present. Where? In this gathering of unimpressive fishermen and the ladies that are married to former carpenters. God is present in this gathering. Yes, why? Because they follow Jesus Christ and those followers of Jesus Christ are encountering the supernatural results of being filled by the presence of God. What implications does this have for us, these supernatural results? It means we must not be afraid of God doing through us what we transparently cannot do on our own. My friends, we must not be afraid of that. That is the definition of the Christian life. When I was in Phoenix, some of you may have heard the story before, but it illustrates the point. I was was sitting outside, there was a church building, and it was a nice day, I was just just reading or something, and, and, and there was men working on the roof of our church building there, and they were trying to do something with the the, the drainage system from, from the roof. Phoenix gets heavy rains and then no rain. That's the way it works. And so they're trying to, to figure out the water capacity of a certain, certain pipe, certain drain. So there's a guy up on top of the roof and there's a guy on the bottom and I'm watching the guy on the bottom and he's, he's trying to see if, if the water flow can build up at a certain point. Obviously, that's what they're trying to do. So he's on the radio, there's a guy up on the roof and as he's there, he's sort of holding this little cap on the edge of the pipe there, and he, and he holds it there, and he says, all right, go ahead, and they begin raising the water, and then I see him begin to say, oh, oh, that's, that's, that's not going to work, that's not going to work, and the cap comes, comes blowing off. He says, oh, great. So wait, hold it, stop the water. So he puts the cap back on, and then he, he gets a stone, and he tries to put the stone on, and the whole goal of this cap is that there's just a, a little stream of water that comes out. And he, he puts the stone on, and he says, okay, go ahead, and he begins to Watch the water, and you can see this stone. It's just there's no way. It's, it's not going to stop this flow of water. It's too much water. And there it blows off. The st- oh, gosh. Okay, hold, stop, wait, stop, stop, stop. So then he gets it on there, and then he, he, he's going to stop it now himself. So he puts his foot there, and this big dude, and he's going to, and he begins, okay, you go ahead. And I'm watching this mischievously, not desiring to help at all. I'm just going to enjoy <laughs> Well, it seems obviously going to happen. So he's holding it there, and you can see him begin to struggle. You see him begin to, he's trying to hold it, and he's trying to hold it, and, he, and he's, oh, no, and then here it comes, and it just gets all over him, and I just thought it was a great part of my day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, our temptation is to want to make our Christian life like that. So much, God, but not more. I mean, I want to grow in holiness so much. 
I, I, I want to grow in my love for your word, where, where the Holy Spirit is re-speaking it into my heart. But, but, but Lord, so much. I want to see you gather people from every tribe and nation and be used in the proclamation of your mighty works. But reasonably, rationally. Let's, let's not have a flood. I, I have a, a, a nice cap here, God. And, and it's fitted so that whatever you do, it, it'll just flow very naturally into my existing way of life. And, and I've created just the, the perfect place for you to move. It'll fit just perfectly Tuesday evenings at 7. And I, that'd be great. If, if you could just move Tuesday evenings at 7, that, that would be fantastic. Or, or just a little bit every day. And, and, and that'll just be great. So much, God, it would be marvelous. I, I, I don't want to be like those pagans. I want God in my life. Friends, so many of you know this. God doesn't want to be part of our life. He wants to be our life. He doesn't want to trickle in. And frankly, if... If you're a good Western thinker, that's terrifying. Because we've been told our whole lives, I think, therefore I am. And God says, <laughs> I'm here, therefore I'll do whatever I want. <laughs> Let me ask you, can you say that to God? Do whatever you want. He's a good God. He wants to turn people from darkness to light. He wants to turn us from sin to righteousness. He wants to make us long for heaven. Everything he does is good. But sometimes when the flood of his presence is moving and advancing, when he's on the move, you know what gets knocked out of the way? Things that we'd rather lean on than him. Things that we're enjoying more than him comfortable things like our reputation and our comfort and our schedule and our hobbies and our comfortable relationships. And he begins to move. And all of a sudden, it's like, I don't feel comfortable without this pillow to lean on. I feel like I'm, I'm being thrust out into an area and, and I'm totally at the mercy of Yes, you are. What does that mean for you right now? Does, does that mean that there's a, a particular Christian friend that the Spirit of God is wanting to link you to, but it's, it's, it's a little frightening, it's, it's scary, it's like, I, I like comfortable and familiar. Or is there a neighbor that we're called to reach out to? It's like, I don't know them, and I like comfortable and familiar. Or is there a certain pattern of life that we're going to have to change? Maybe it's getting up earlier, or maybe it's, it's getting to bed earlier so that we can spend more time in his word. But we're like, this is a comfortable way of life. Or maybe it's a way we use our finances. And we're like, I don't, I don't want to give this up. This is a comfortable way of life. And God says, let go and be at the good mercy of the flowing and advancing of my spirit in the life of the church. Let go of those things that are the comfortable way of life. No, you can't keep being you the way you are right now and be used by the God of heaven. If you ever talk to somebody and you thought, well, if, if I change that, I'll stop being me. Yes, you will. You'll be a better you because you are at the mercy of the God of heaven who has poured out his spirit in his people to advance his gospel. Supernatural results. I think that's what this list is supposed to indicate. The gospel's going around the world. It's starting here in Jerusalem. Every language all of a sudden is heard proclaiming the mighty works of God. Only God could do that. Guess what? True Israelites, God is on the move again. 
And he's leading people out of captivity and into a promised land. He's doing it again. And he's doing it within the people of God. And yes, if you wanted to see those mighty things that happened in the Old Testament, you better get ready because they're going to happen again. They're not going to happen exactly the same way they did back then, but they're going to happen again spiritually. And God's going to break things and make water flow out again. And he's going to force his people to let go of those things that they'd rather lean on than lean on him and entrust themselves to the mercy of a God who is advancing through history, one conversation at a time and one decision at a time in his people. Finally, the revealing response. Revealing response You notice in verse 7, it says that everybody was amazed and astonished. Amazed and astonished. That's the the obvious initial reaction. Shock. Amazed and astonished. How is this possible? Totally appropriate opening question. How is this possible? But then notice down there in verse 12, there is this divide that seems to take place. What does this mean? Say many in the crowd. What does this mean? And apparently, the point of that is that these people are willing to admit that they cannot understand in their natural mind what is taking place. They cannot understand it. So you have the curious but willing to admit they can't understand group, but then there's this other group, and they begin to mock what is happening. And they say, I can understand it. They're filled with new wine. They are drunk. You notice that this is true from the Bible's perspective. Uh, Cynicism um, is so determined to hold on to their natural perspective that they'll be illogical to defend it. Well, they're drunk. That's why they're speaking perfectly in another language. Because, you know, that happens all the time. People get drunk. That's a very regular drunken manifestation. I mean, you can drink enough wine, man, and you start just spouting off all kinds of languages. That's why I get drunk, so I can speak to people from different countries, you know. That's what they seem to be saying. Haven't that happened to you, Joe? Absolutely, every time. Every time. I just start speaking, and I, I go to a different quarter, and I'm just engaging with them. That's what I... I, I mean, it's re- foolishness. How could that possibly explain what is happening? Let me just clarify. You're, you're understanding them from, from Rome? You're, you're understanding what they're saying? Yes, I am. Oh, clearly, clearly too much alcohol is clearly, clearly the explanation. They're, they're mocking. Look at those drunken fools. They're mocking them. But we know as the readers, and here's another example of biblical irony, we know that the real mockery taking place is towards these foolish people who refuse to see what is right in front of them. That they see, but they do not see. And they hear, but they do not understand, as Isaiah would have said. Always seeing, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. We have this revealing response. What does it reveal? It reveals that when God begins to move, there's going to be some who will say, what does this mean? What does this mean? And God has to provide the answer. There's going to be a a curiosity. I think this is going to be true when people are around the church as well. There will be some who will say, "What, what does this mean? Curious, a certain curiosity that God and his work births in their heart. But there will be others who, in spite of the transparent evidence of God before them, will say, I can explain this, and it's nothing impressive. And they'll turn the work of God into mockery against his church. Brothers and sisters, that is going to happen. And and just just a word, if there's any of you that are sitting here in this room, and this this is a a big gathering, so this is possible, and there's maybe uh, youth here and kids that this could be uh, present in you. If you're tempted to think little of God, to think that God and following him is silly and worthless, well, you find your place in this passage you're like these people that said, oh, what, what's got happening over there? That's just a bunch of drunk people. They don't know anything. They're out of their minds. My friends, we, we need to be sobered and fearful of mocking the God who is on the move. 
I, I just had a particular burden for, for, for if, if you're here and you're a young person and you're aware of the typical late night comedy line that makes fun of God on the move, be very careful. God will not be mocked. And what one sows, one will reap. If you sow to the laughing mockery of God, you will reap God revealing himself to you in a way that you do not want him to. That's what this response reveals, that the human heart it, it is curious, but at some level, some of them also turn quickly to a cynical mockery. But also what this response reveals is that ultimately, only the proclamation of the gospel can save. I'm so struck by that in this passage. Th this miracle, as profound and supernatural as it was, could not by itself save anyone. They're perplexed. They're surprised. Some of them turn to mockery immediately. But you can't separate this passage from what immediately follows when Peter begins to preach. And he preaches about Jesus Christ, the crucified one. And after his preaching, 3,000 people are saved. So the Spirit of God moves Peter to proclaim the gospel of God, and that gospel of God saves. But it's important to, to realize and remember, look, there, there, is, there is one thing that can save people from staying merely at curiosity or moving towards mockery. There is one thing that can save people, and that is the proclamation of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. This is a warning, I think, for, for churches or Christians who would, would, would want to emphasize or prioritize uh, physical um, sort of presentations or, or the drama of a, a church gathering and, and lights and so forth. There's nothing wrong with lights, nothing wrong with music, but, but we have to be careful that our heart isn't set on wowing people into the kingdom. There's only one big amazing, incredible message that can save people. That's the person and work of Jesus Christ. There is an emphasis here on the need for the word. So that quote, for example, that has been attributed to St. Francis, I don't think it's definite that he actually said this, but preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Acts chapter 2 obliterates that. Look, there, there is no demonstration of God's power greater physically than what happened here. Language is being displayed. And yet salvation doesn't come merely by the display of God's physical power, whether it be through the work of the church or in a miraculous display like this. Ultimately, it comes when Jesus is proclaimed. So preach the gospel, and what that means is to use words. And yes, reflect it in, in, in praying for healing, that God would be demonstrated as powerful and divine in our midst, and, and praying for supernatural events that might draw people to hear the message. Yes, absolutely, but ultimately, what this response reveals is that these people need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. My friends, if, if the miracle of Pentecost didn't by itself save anybody... Then, then our living a good life in front of people is not going to save anybody either. So I, I, I hope we're good neighbors, and I hope we are kind, and we take out the mail, and we have a nice conversation with people at times, and we're, we're gentle and kind, but, but, but ultimately, at, at some point, the same gospel that Peter proclaimed has to be proclaimed. They're not going to be saved by looking at a Christian who is living a supernatural life by itself. They're only going to be saved if people proclaim Jesus Christ. That's what we have to do. That's what we have to do. And we also have to ask, what is our response since we know what has caused this? They're perplexed and are amazed. What's our response? Well, our response must be to believe and freshly believe, freshly believe that God's spirit in God's people will transform the world with the gospel. Look, if, if you've been a Christian for 25 years plus, it is so easy to lose your first passion, isn't it? 
to lose your, your, your hunger to see God move in your life and to grow gradually depressed at the long battle against sin and the, the difficulty of temptation and the weariness of doing good. But friends, let's, let's have a fresh childlike love, especially if, you, if you're a 25-year, 20-year-plus Christian. Let's have a fresh love for this passage and what it means for us. God is still moving through his people to proclaim his gospel around the world. He's still doing it in you. I don't care if you're 65 years old or you're 26 years old, you've been a Christian a long time, or you just got saved. God is moving in you, Christian, in you, to proclaim this gospel that is advancing around the world. And he's determined to remove you from those things that you love holding on to and to mess up your way of life so that you can include more of him and his power in you. Dads, if there's one reason you're a dad, this is the reason. To help your family experience and know that God is on the move through his people to proclaim his gospel. If there's one thing you want to leave to your children, it's a passion for the gospel that can only be explained by the Spirit of God working in you. There's other things that are important, but that's the most important thing. Moms, if, if, if you have young children and you're discouraged by the day in and day out and regularity of doing the same thing over and over again, let, let me encourage you, this is why you're a mom. This is why. This is why. This is more important than their, their academic success or their learning to make their better anything else. This is why. This is the main reason you're a mom, to bear witness to God being on the move through the proclamation of his gospel. And no, you're not supposed to be able to do all this in your own strength. So if you feel weak, so much the better. God will get all the glory. God, the God of heaven and earth, is on the move in his people to transform his world by the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's on the move in you. He's on the move. Let's pray. Lord, I want to pray in particular for the young people this morning. Lord, just a burden on my heart. Lord, anybody that's 20 and under. Lord, I, I just want to lift them up right now. I pray, Lord, that you would anoint young people in our church with a passion for your gospel. I pray you would raise up young men who are called to preach your word full time one day. I pray you would raise up young women who are powerful witnesses to your gospel. I pray, Lord, that you would raise up those who say no to the world and yes to your glory and live lives of radical holiness for the sake of your mission. I pray you would raise up those who will preach the gospel to other nations that will reflect the gospel in their relationships, that will build future churches, plant future churches. Lord, I pray you would turn young people away from the temptations of sin. You would deliver them from the evil one. Lord, and I pray for those that are no longer children that have been following you for decades. I pray that you would restore our first passion for you, our hunger for your presence, our love for your gospel, our desire to live a supernatural life, encountering you day after day, stepping out in faith to be used by you, casting aside our, our pillars of confidence and entrusting ourselves to your power and mercy. Move in us, Spirit of God, for the treasuring and proclamation of your gospel. Tear from us everything we trust in other than you. We thank you in Jesus' name.